Okay. It should be recording now. Okay, so now we can go back to the presentation again. Sorry for this. So, um, yeah, normally we would be in week three of uh, the Mining Global Health already, uh, and then everything would have been organized for your trips abroad, but then Corona came, and so we're here in Rotterdam um, for 10 weeks. Uh, still, I hope that you will enjoy uh, the program and we will go to the program uh, a little bit later on. So, um, again, welcome. Um, and of course, these are very challenging times in times of um, Corona. Um, everything has changed. Um, the, whole, the whole world has changed. And, and of course, we have to see for how long this will be uh, will be the case. Still, I'm very happy that you all applied and that we have 96 students in um, in the minor, um, and that we have a lot of countries where hopefully you can can go to um, next year. But also, all these countries, all these sites are really participating in uh, the minor global health for for this edition. Uh, and I come back to that uh, to that later on. Because of Corona, and I've said this earlier, um, we've made a thematic approach now for this minor global health and called it Corona is global health. Because I think if you look at the Corona pandemic, uh, that it really shows that Corona is not only an infectious disease. Corona is a disease which affects every parts of uh, society, um, health, healthcare, of course, disease but also the economy, uh, social structures, uh, unrest, uh, hunger, poverty, uh, and whatever you can, uh, you can think of. And we try to address that in this minor global health. Um, I guess for all of us, this is the real, very first real pandemic, uh, very first real pandemic in this age. Um, and, um, Perhaps when you are 70 or 80, you will talk with your grandchildren uh, about 2020 and about that then that was a real specific year because then we had the Corona pandemic. Uh, perhaps we will have more pandemics, who knows, uh, for, for the coming years, but probably we'll have. Um, but what it shows is that, that diseases do not stop at borders. And of course, you've all seen the political debates on closing borders um, if you look at the European Union, for instance, it's, the European Union didn't act like the European Union, but countries acted individually, putting up borders uh, again. Um, but as we've seen, disease and specifically Corona doesn't stop at uh, doesn't stop at border at borders. So, um, as I said, this is the first modern uh, pandemic. This is from um, Gates Notes. So Bill Gates, you all know, former head of Microsoft, now mainly known for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, supporting all kinds of healthcare related uh, inventions, vaccines and other interventions to make life better in, in, in the world. Uh, he has a blog and uh, this is from, from his blog uh, about Corona and the first modern uh, pandemic. Um, and so Richard Horton is the main chief editor of uh, The Lancet. Um, and uh, Richard Horton states that coronavirus is the greatest global science policy failure in a generation. And this is something we will try to address in the minor global health uh, as well. Um, because people did not communicate uh, you can blame the Chinese for being late uh, in uh, finding uh, that there was a new viral disease going on and finding what the cause of the disease was. Um, but it really shows how countries work. And I, I guess so next week we will have a masterclass by Frank Snowden, um, uh, who is more like a historian. Um, and, and the funny thing is that if you look into history, um, many things repeat itself also during this uh, corona pandemic um, 
the scientists said, so we do it ourselves. Yes, we travel up and down. Um, I had a lot of colleagues, specifically infectious disease doctors who got ill from Corona uh, in, in, in March, April. Um, many of them went to Austria to do some skiing. Uh, many of them went to Italy when it wasn't known that Corona was around. They fell ill. Uh, and indeed, we do it ourselves. Um, and uh, we will see later on also uh, in, in the minor that if you look at Ebola, uh, for instance, an earlier epidemic, not a pandemic, luckily, um, it's really about habitat and uh, deforestation uh, and the closer interactions we have with animals like bats and other animals, whereby uh, viruses and other uh, microorganisms can uh, cross the species barrier and cause new uh, diseases, new epidemics like SARS-CoV-2 now. And, and of course, you all seen Marion Koopmans on the news uh, now and then, the head of the virus science department here. They do a lot of research in um, Corona uh, at the moment. Uh, they are a leading department in developing vaccines uh, together with companies in the world as well. Um, which Bart Haagmans is, is heading and Bart will also give a lecture on vaccine development and, and what we can expect from vaccine development in uh, for, for Corona. Um, but many experts state that, that Corona will be uh, with us for, for the coming years uh, and that it will be a flu-like illness added to the flu epidemics we have every year um, and, and that we it will take years before we will get back to business as uh, as usual. Um, also, in the countries you uh, you will be going to, we see that they're struggling with uh, with this pandemic. Uh, I was in in uh, Indonesia the first two weeks of March this year. Uh, at that moment, we already had cases of Corona in the Netherlands. We also had the first cases of, of Corona in, in Indonesia. Um, and like other countries, Indonesia was very slow to, to act. The government was very slow to act on uh, Corona disease and, and uh, testing and lockdown measures uh, and whatever. So WHO really urged the president to declare national emergency and, and act uh, take measures, uh, social distancing, lockdown, etc. Because what was not clear from the official statistics, because official statistics said there were not so many cases, uh, was clear from funeral data uh, where there was a spike in uh, funerals in, uh, in Jakarta. And there was a very uh, special dedicated funeral fields for patients who were supposed to, be, to have died from, uh, from coronavirus. So on the one hand, you see a government struggling and saying, ah, we don't have so big a problem. And on the other hand, you will see that there are many uh, that overkill because of Corona looking at funeral reports uh, in, in these countries. And Indonesia is not the only country where they have been, uh, where they have been struggling. This is from this week, uh, India with the highest number of Corona cases, uh, also the highest number of Corona cases per day still the government is reducing social distancing and lockdown measures um, because of uh, the economy and because social distancing and lockdown measures hurt the economy perhaps even with worse consequences than, than COVID or Corona uh, itself. Um, then an optimistic uh, note from WHO that uh, we will need two years before we can have this pandemic over and then we have to see what is left. We'll get back to that later on. Uh, and another issue which will be tackled in this minor global health as well is that, of course, we have Corona, but if you look at the number of deaths worldwide from Corona and if you compare that with HIV, TB, malaria, malnutrition, upper respiratory tract infections in children, uh, gastrointestinal infections in children, um, then those still rank much higher than the death rates uh, because of, uh, of Corona. And sometimes things go really well. 
so uh, this is just uh, to show you that polio in Africa has been uh, eliminated now um, and also from the, the northern part of, uh, of Nigeria. Uh, it took a long time to, to get polio uh, eliminated uh, there and we have to see what the future brings. But sometimes we can do real good things uh, in the world as well, next to having this corona pandemic. Uh, testing, of course, testing capacity is is an issue. Um, as I said, Indonesia said they didn't have that many numbers. In African countries, probably the numbers are much higher than reported. Uh, so we're really in very unsure what is what is going on uh, over there, except for South Africa, which have a very well organized uh, tracing, uh, contact tracing, and, and testing uh, policy at uh, at the moment. Um, and then, of course, um, all the effects of, of Corona on, on society. So this is, there's no carnival in Curaçao next year. Uh, probably if you cycle to uh, Erosos MC, you will see this banner, no festivals, das good. Um, so just to look at the societal um, uh, aspects um, of, of Corona, uh, elections being postponed in, in New Zealand, um, SSR being, uh, or at least planned to be uh, uh, eliminated or banned from, from the Eureka Week uh, by the Oslo University because the dispute had some corona cases because they went on holidays in Greece. Um, I will come back to this one later. Um, and then... Um, the other thing um, which is happening is stigma. And perhaps you heard the stories about South Africa that there people think that stigma around Corona is even worse than on HIV. Um, and there was a, uh, an article in the Volkskrant last weekend uh, with an interview with the first Corona case. Um, and she and her mother were the first two corona cases in, in Indonesia. And everyone knew her mobile phone number, where she lived. There were strikes in front of her house. Um, people said she did it herself. Uh, she was a dance teacher. Um, so very many consequences uh, as society, but also individually as, uh, as patients. Uh, and the same we've seen for uh, Ebola. So people are very much afraid that they after they have contracted Ebola, that you shouldn't be with such a patient, the same for, for Corona, but also after patients have uh, been cured uh, and signs and symptoms have resolved, that still uh, they're stigmatized and, and people stay away from uh, patients after Corona infection as well. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw the, the, the paper in the, in the Volkskrant uh, today, where there's a discussion on uh, how long patients after Corona are effective uh, or can transmit the virus to people in their surroundings. And there's a lot of fuss and a lot of um, fake news uh, around it, uh, because as we know now, after 10 to 14 days, everyone uh, after contracting Corona will have antibodies, will have immunity and will have cleared the virus. So if you past two weeks, you're not spreading the disease, but people do not know that, do not understand that, uh, and people get stigmatized because of that. Uh, of course, we've seen an increase in, in numbers, um, uh, and the mayor uh, making uh, mouth masks uh, compulsory in, in the city center. As of yesterday, that's not necessary anymore, but okay, so we will have a lecture later on about the use of mouth masks and aerosols in, in the transmission of, of, uh, of Corona uh, as well. Uh, the mayor, Abu Talib, uh, inviting student societies to uh, comply with social distancing measures to uh, prevent Corona from spreading within uh, the student societies. Um, and then, of course, a couple of weeks ago that uh, the government was looking into uh, banning all introduction uh, activities from first year students. Luckily, that didn't happen. But of course, the way uh, these introduction weeks were organized were very different than uh, than before. Um, 
and of course also a campaign among students. I'm not sure how, if you uh, are going to, to be tested or have been tested when you felt a little bit ill or were coughing or sneezing. Um, I guess that everyone should, should, should know that, that if the virus is circulating among young people, you can easily transmit it to your parents or your grandparents and thereby fueling the, uh, the epidemic uh, as well. Um, and that's something which everyone should, should need to know. And I guess that also as a medical student or at least as a university student, you should, be, you should set an example uh, in my opinion. And then of course, there has been uh, news items on uh, a party, a beach volleyball tournament organized by MFVR uh, and, and Corona. Uh, and also there you see that newspapers are very eager to publish things which afterwards didn't seem to be true. Um, so the blame game is uh, is there as well, uh, of course. Um, and then, of course, we have the discussions about the, what I mentioned earlier: mouth masks. Should we wear mouth masks? Uh, Europe is wearing mouth masks. Uh, we not really. So do they work? And why do they work? And do they not work? And why should they not work? Um, do you transmit the virus in in the airplane while traveling from A to B? Uh, today there was a news item that one of the TUI flights from Zakintosh to, to the UK, uh, 16 people were tested positive and probably more will test positive because they didn't comply with Corona regulations. So we do it ourselves. Um, and then of course, if we move to, to the US, um, there's a governor uh, blocking mayors from, from people uh, wearing masks in, in public. And of course, if you look at the Trump White House, then uh, they're not really into, uh, into the science. And, and so the press secretaries even said the science should not stand in the way of reopening schools. Yeah, I think we are in the lucky situation in the Netherlands that the government listens to experts uh, and listens to the science and tries to deal with it in the best way uh, possible. One other thing which is, is a is repeating during pandemics, and, and we will discuss that tomorrow with Richard Skolnick's masterclass and also next week with Frank Snowden's masterclass. Um, sorry, this one is. So, um, that the army gets involved into uh, policies, uh, policy making, and we even saw that there was a medical center that for to, to see which hospitals have been overburdened and where patients need to be moved from one hospital to another. Shut up. Um, that's a problem if you have an ordinary phone, you cannot shut it down. Um, but that the army was involved as well to, to play a role in, in logistics of transferring patients from one hospital to, to another. Uh, and there was really a war room at the educational center, at the Russell Medical Center, to, to do that on a national uh, level. Um, and also there you see that um, things are not, uh, the army doesn't do things perfectly as well, because in the first couple of days, Sorry. So just put it down the hard way. Um, that even the army had problems in organizing uh, these these logistics in transferring patients from hospital A to uh, to B in uh, in the Netherlands. But we'll get back to the army uh, next week uh, and the involvement of the army in pandemics uh, later on. Um, and then um, pandemics and climate change. I guess that, that it's clear that, that because of deforestation, climate change, a lot of infectious diseases are re-emerging. Uh, Erik van Gorp later on will discuss that with you as well. Uh, and coronavirus is, is, is one of the examples. So we will have a masterclass on climate change and planetary health, as Andy Haynes would like to say it in a couple of weeks, to discuss this uh, as well with you. And then, of course, the more societal, economical uh, aspects of, of Corona. Um, many countries cannot afford uh, lockdown measures because it just 
destroys the the economy uh, small on a small scale level on a personal level but also on a on a, a country level uh, as well so there's a real balance in, in how to keep things turning and going and prevent countries from 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 going bankrupt um migration um uh, probably will increase because people will tend to to go to other countries where healthcare or the economy is better um, because of lockdown measures you see that the shortage of, of food and nutrition and an increase in childhood uh, malnutrition and thus uh, hunger and hunger not only in developing countries but also uh, of course in uh, in the US with jobs lost, uh, people having no employment, no money, no house, no health insurance. So how should you live in a country like that during a Corona crisis? Um, and of course, it will have much more impact in the poor countries uh, than, than, than in the West uh, as well. And everything we do not do to contain this epidemic will have um, consequences for the poor countries as well. Other viruses are resurging. So measles is resurging uh, among uh, developing countries because vaccine programs are halted. Even in the Netherlands, for a couple of months, vaccine programs were halted because uh, on the five clinics, so the, the Kolstadsbureaus were shut down uh, because of, of Corona, which could have effects, serious effects on, on, on new epidemics. And the measles, this is really uh, the case. Um, And then also uh, because of lockdown, uh, people with HIV AIDS cannot go to the hospital, cannot get tested, cannot get the medication. Um, so also for um, the HIV AIDS epidemic, it's estimated that there will be half a million uh, extra AIDS deaths in Africa because of, uh, of lockdown uh, measures and the impact of Corona on, on these societies. And, and this was in the news yesterday evening. I'm not sure if you saw this, um, that uh, sometimes in countries, the enforcement of lockdown measures is such harsh that it leads to police violence and deaths, not because of Corona, but because of the police force being too harsh on people uh, to, to enforce lockdown measures. And I guess that, that perhaps the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations in, in the US relate to that as well. Okay, then to, to treatment. Um, so we will uh, discuss that later on as well. Of course, this is new, completely new disease. We look into how to treat um, this, um, this virus, this epidemic. Um, and, and so far we've only seen two drugs, dexamethasin to reduce the inflammation and remdesivir, which is an antiviral drug to be somewhat effective uh, and all the other medications we use are clearly not effective. And it also holds true for hydroxychloroquine, which is an antimalarial drug. And the funny thing is in the Spanish flu in 1918, uh, also there, they used quinine as an antimalarial drug to try to fight the influenza pandemic at that moment. So 100 years later, with all the science and all the um, uh, medication and, 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 and healthcare uh, improvements, vaccinations and others we have, we still go back to antimalarials to try to treat uh, viral uh, disease. We did it with the Spanish flu in 1918 and we do it with Corona in 2020. In both cases, it didn't work, just to be clear. Um, convalescent plasma, so using antibodies from patients who have recovered from um, Corona, um, was a huge study which was started by Bart Reines at the uh, Erosa Medical Center. The study has been halted already again uh, because of non-efficacy. And I will, we will come back to that later on why uh, it seems like it's a good idea to do this. Um, but in, in, in real life, it turns out so much more difficult to, to use this as a uh, treatment option. And then again, it's of course only a treatment option which is available in the rich countries and not in poor countries. And, and then we get to the vaccines. So Bart Hagmans, as I said, will give a lecture on vaccines, vaccine development. When can we expect a vaccine? Um, 
I hope somewhere in March, April. So that traveling next year, uh, second part of next year will be possible without restrictions. Um, but of course, there's also this, this rush in vaccines. Uh, you've say, seen the, the Russian vaccine, which has been, which has been marketed and distributed in Russia. Um, no data on that, no safety data, no efficacy data. And, and what really has been a problem in, in earlier years is that vaccines were introduced too early with a lot of side effects. And if you do that, then people will not want to be vaccinated and you make it very much worse than if you wait for proper studies, take your time uh, and find uh, the right vaccine for, for, this, vac uh, for this disease. So um, being in a hurry is not, uh, is not a good uh, characteristic of, of trying to find the best vaccine for a new disease. And then um, to um, to conclude with for for this part is um, you hear a lot of people talking about this is just a flu-like illness. So Corona, COVID. Why should you care about it? Um, and that's also with the people of virus wahnsinn or virus weinheit uh, that is said, ah, it's just a flu, you're just coughing and sneezing and etc. So why should you bother? Now, what I would like to tell to, to you, but also to, uh, to the people who, who tell me that is that it would have been nice for them to be to visit the hospital in March, April, when we were at the peak of the, the first wave in the Netherlands. And just to look at the patients who were admitted with COVID. Uh, and yes, young people, mainly patients without risk factors, uh, patients, people below 70, without hypertension, diabetes, without obesity, very often only have a mild flu-like uh, illness. But also there, uh, sometimes people develop a very uh, serious uh, disease. Our youngest case uh, being admitted to uh, to the ICU was 16 years of age, very healthy, very skinny guy. Um, he survived. We had a still have uh, a young woman woman um, who was admitted with very severe uh, COVID, uh, being uh, in need of of respiratory support, being admitted to the ICU while being pregnant for nearly 24 weeks. So then you get an option, do we terminate the pregnancy to save the mother or what should we do? And really COVID-19 is a, is, a, is a very nasty uh, disease. If you look at the x-rays of people being admitted to the hospital, you, you will right away understand that if you've had corona, um, and if you had a pneumonia from, from corona, that it will take years before you recover if you even fully uh, recover. Um, so it's a really nasty disease and, and after discharge you're not cured. Uh, it will take weeks, months, years perhaps in many people to recover um, and some will, will not even recover fully because of, of corona. It's very different from, from flu in, uh, in that sense um, and I said it's a very nasty disease. So people who say it's just a flu-like disease get to the hospital and look at the patients with, uh, with COVID. And I think you will uh, come to another conclusion. Um, and then, yes, so I said, perhaps in, in when you're 70 or 80, you will tell your grandchild children that 2020 was a very special year, but of course we don't know if this will be the last pandemic. I, I spoke with, with uh, Rolf Fouché. Rolf Fouché is one of the, uh, professors at the fire science uh, department. He's heading the, the influenza group uh, over there. Um, and he is happy that his group can work on influenza again, because uh, Ron said this is flu and the new flu, the new Spanish flu is going to be the new next uh, pandemic uh, in the coming 10 or 20 years. So Corona is not the last pandemic. We will see it probably also not the last pandemic. You will see, um, but we never know. And we have to get prepared, better prepared even to, to combat these kind of pandemics than we did for, for Corona. 
Um, because, and this is a quote from, from the name giver of a university by David Thierry Rosman, prevention is, is better than cure. Um, so we really should prepare to prevent these pandemics instead of waiting for us to, to pandemics to, uh, to happen with all the consequences it has now. Okay, are there questions uh, so far? No one? Okay. Then uh, what I want to do is, oh, sorry, is to take you to the program, uh, to just show you what is uh, at what moment, and also to discuss about um, the assignments you can do, um, shortly something about the exam, and, and, and also in short something about uh, the trip abroad uh, later on. So, um, First, we want to do a quiz, um, and uh, that's just to test your knowledge on on global health and how you think the world is uh, is behaving, in um, how developments in uh, in the world are. So, oh. so my question to you is just to to scan this QR code. This QR code will take you to. Um, Google uh, quiz in, in Google Forms, um, and there are 13 questions um, being asked based on uh, the book Factfulness from, from Hans Rosling, and we will uh, get back to, to this book and to the results of the questions after you've taken the quiz. So I will give you 10 minutes to, to do the quiz, and then I get back to you uh, to see the results. Is that okay with you? Meneer, de, we hebben rechten nodig voor de quiz. Voor meneer oh. kan alleen worden weergegeven door gebruikers in de organisatie. Oh, 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 oh. Then I will have to change something. One moment. I will stop sharing my, my slides and then... Uh, Probably that's because you're not logged in with your Global Health Education account, but we can fix that uh, as well. Let's see. Does it work now? If you try again? Oh, I have to put it up again, of course. Sorry. Okay, does it work now? Yeah, okay. So 10 minutes and then uh, we'll get to the results.
so I have more than 90 answers. So I guess if you're okay with that, we'll just go through the answers because this is every year. This is very, very interesting uh, to um, to do. Sorry for for the ones who don't speak Dutch that it wasn't in Dutch. Sorry for that. I should have thought about it better. And I will translate the questions uh, and then uh, go uh, go through the answers because it, I think you should all read the book Factfulness uh, and, and and why I will try to uh, to show you um, and then we go to what is it to the form. So um, I hope you can see. Um, my Google form open now. Yeah. Okay. So I have 94 answers. And uh, so there were 13 questions. So you could score 13 points as a maximum. And what you see is that on average, you scored four out of 13. Meaning that you are, your, your worldview is much more pessimistic than it in reality uh, is uh, and it gets distorted because of all the news we see about bad things um, happening uh, in the world. So I go. We will go to the questions one by one. So um, the first question was for the ones in the, who don't speak Dutch. In the in the last twenty years, the percentage of people uh, living in extreme poverty uh, has halved. So the majority of you say that it has doubled uh, or uh, stayed the same, and only 25% of you say that it is halved, but it is really halved. Perhaps now with Corona or the problem, um, we'll come back to that later, um, but poverty, extreme poverty has halved in the last 20 years. So how many um, children at the age of one uh, will have been vaccinated? So the majority, nearly 50% of you say only 20%. Well, in reality, it's 80% and only 19, only 20% only uh, have that answer uh, correct. So you can say anything about WHO and, and public health and vaccination policies, etc. But this is one thing the world is really good in. I showed you the example of polio elimination from, from Africa. Uh, there are things we, we can do really well. Um, then about uh, how many deaths uh, there were per year by natural disasters. And of course, we see natural disasters on the news every day. Uh, tropical storms, cyclones, uh, uh, flooding, earthquakes, uh, whatever. But again, in reality, um, this has halved in, uh, in the last 100 years. So we much more prepared for natural disasters and to prevent disease and death from natural disasters than we were 100 years ago. Not so much about pandemics, but okay, that's that's something uh, we will deal later. Um, then where um, do you think the majority of the people live? And so nearly 80% of you say that the majority of the world population lives in poor countries. Not true. Majority of the people live in countries with an uh, average income. Um, and of course, you were all correct that it was not in high income countries. But if you look at a country like Indonesia, so 250 million or 270 million people live in, living in a country like Indonesia, Indonesia is not a poor country. There are poor people in Indonesia, but it's not a poor country. It's a middle income uh, country. India is a middle income country. China is a middle income country. Um, so uh, the majority of people li really live in uh, countries with middle who are um, who have middle income, so some average income. And this is also a very striking one. So if on average um, men uh, at the age of thirty now have spent ten years in school, how many years do women of uh, the same age, so 30 years of age, uh, have spent in school. And um, it is nine years. So it is nearly as good as and as long as 
as the men. Um, and there again, so only 10% had uh, had the right answer. So you really have a feeling because of all the things you see and read in in the news or see on television that women do far worse than than men. Not the case. Of course, there are countries where the position of women is far worse than for for men. But on average, it's not. It's if you look at education, it's not uh, that bad. And of course, it could be better because. Factfulness really dis, uh, describes a, a very optimistic uh, worldview. Uh, but what Hans Rosling, uh, so he, he died a couple of years ago, but what he always said is that uh, things are going good, but they could be better. So there's always room for improvement. So in nine years or 10 years uh, in, in school, if you are 30 years of age, of course, if you compare that to the Dutch situation, it's really low, um, but still. So there's room for improvement. Um, so then the figure where uh, the majority of people uh, were living and we, which figure was uh, the right uh, figure, not the 50% of you, the majority uh, put the right figure on. So that the majority of people were living in Asia, then uh, Africa, and that the minority of uh, world population lives in the Americas and in, uh, in Europe. Um, and then this is also very, very interesting. Uh, so uh, in 2100, uh, so in 80 years, uh, it's estimated that there will be 11 billion people or 12 billion people uh, living uh, in the world. Uh, and the question is, uh, what is the, 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 the foremost reason why this increase in population size globally will happen? Um, and um, what is what is happening here is that what you see, for instance, in Africa. In Africa, there will be the the the, the continent where there will be the biggest increase in population. Um, so people there now are young, uh, and they will become uh, adults. Um, and, and if you look at the population pyramid in many African countries, then you see that the vast majority of the population in those countries are below 40 years of age, are young people young persons and they will get they will get uh, older so it's it's there will be more uh, adults um, and of course finally if things progress if they continue to progress there will be also more elderly people as well um, so then uh, the question again about girls and, and finishing primary school um, which only 11% of you had correct. So that is 60%, so not 20, not 40, 60, not 100, but room for improvement again, but it's better than you uh, you thought. Um, and then um, this question about there are 2 billion people, 2 billion children under the age of 15 in the world now, uh, how will that be in 2100? And that of course relates to this question about how population structure will look uh, globally. But the number of children will not change, will probably decline even because birth rate will drop with economic progress. Uh, so there will not be many, many, many new babies uh, born, not more than, than is currently uh, the case. Now, 80% of uh, people in the world have some access to, to electricity. Uh, solar, of course, is very important in, uh, in this uh, respect. Um, then the question, what the average uh, life expectancy is in, uh, in the world, that is 70, not 50, not 60, it's 70 on average. Um, and then uh, the question about uh, the, the tiger and the pandas and, and, and the black rhinoceros. Uh, um, in none of these situations, uh, the last 10 years, the, the situation of these three endangered species has, has worsened. So it, of course it's still worse, but it didn't get worse. Uh, and this one, yeah, you all know, the temperature is, uh, is rising. So, okay, so why um, so much about this? Uh, I, I guess that it is, um important for you to realize that that what you hear in the news and what you hear on television 
doesn't necessarily reflect how things are developing in the world. And and of course, Hans Rosling was a very was very optimistic, and there are more pessimistic people around. Um, but but as I said already, what he said was as well. Uh, there's still room for improvement. The world is not perfect, uh, far from uh, perfect, and there are a lot of too many poor people living in really bad circumstances. Um, and of course, if you look at gastrointestinal infections, if you look at pulmonary infections, these are all preventable uh, diseases. Uh, so there's still a lot of work uh, to do, but it is much better than what you think uh, it is and what a lot of other people think uh, it is. Um, one thing, so in the book, uh, and I will really advise you to uh, to read it. It's 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 not that, that big. It's not that costly. It's about 30, 40 euros, something like that, or 20 euros. I'm not sure. Um, it's available at ball.com uh, and elsewhere. Um, there's one um, part in the book where Hans Rosling discusses uh, what could go wrong with the progress in the world. Um, so there are several items which could cause a change or reversal in, in global progress. And, and, and one would be a nuclear war. Now, everyone can understand that if we have a nuclear war, that things uh, will uh, deteriorate. But the other one is a pandemic. Um, so, and we are now, of course, in a situation, the pandemic. And, and of course, this pandemic will really have devastating effects mainly in the poor countries uh, lowering life expectancy increasing malnutrition hunger as i showed you earlier on so really something to uh, to take into consideration okay so um what i want you to do is to to look at this um, video by by hans rosling because he can very well say uh, what is happening uh, in the world, and he's the only one who can say it in his way. So I will just leave you with uh, this video for the coming 15 minutes and get back to you later on. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yep. Uh, we can't hear the video.
que él sana Sorry, 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 sorry. Ah. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you three multiple choice questions. Use this device, use this device to answer. The first question is, how did the number of deaths per year from natural disaster, how does that change during the last century? Did it more than double? Did it remain about the same in the world as a whole? Or did it decrease to less than half? Please answer, please answer, A, B, or C. I see lots of answers. This is much faster than I do it at universities. They are so slow. They keep thinking, thinking, thinking. Oh, very, very good. And we go to the next question. So how long did women 30 years old in the world go to school? Seven years, five years, or three years? A, B, or C, please answer. And we go to the next question. In the last 20 years, how did the percentage of people in the world who live in extreme poverty change? Extreme poverty, not having enough food for the day. Did it almost double? Did it remain more or less the same or did it half? A, B or C? Now, answers. You see, death from national disasters in the world. You can see it from this graph here from 1900 to 2000. In 1900, there was about half a million people who died every year from national disaster, floods, earthquake, volcanic eruption, whatever, you know, droughts. Right? And, and then how did that change? We asked, Gapminder asked the uh, public in Sweden. This is how they answered. Right? The Swedish public answered like this. 50% thought it had doubled, 38% said it's more or less the same, 12 said it had half. This is the best data from the disaster researchers. Uh, and it goes up and down, and it goes to, to the Second World War, and after that, it starts to fall, and it keeps falling, and it's down to much less than a half. The world has been much, much more capable as the decades go back to protect people from this, you know. So only 12% of the Swedes know this. So I went to the zoo, and I asked the ships. <laughs> The ships doesn't watch the evening news. So the ships, you know, they, they, they just choose by random. So the Swedes answer worse than random. Now, how did you do? That's you. You were beaten by the ships. <laughs> but it was close. You were three times better than the Swedes, you know, but that's not enough. You shouldn't compare yourself to Swedes, you know. You must have higher ambitions in the world. Uh, uh. Let's look at the next answer here. Women in school. Uh. Here, you can see men went eight years. How long did women go to school? Well, we ask the Swedes like this. And that gives you a hint, doesn't it? The right answer is probably the one where fewest Swedes pick, isn't it? <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Here we go. Yes, 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 women have almost catched up. This is the US public. This is the US public, and this is you. Here you come. Ooh. Well, congratulations, you're twice as good as the Swedes, but you don't do me. So, so, how come? I think it's like this, that everyone is aware of that there are countries and there are areas where girls have great difficulties, they are stopped when they go to school, you know, and it's, it, it's disgusting. But in the majority of the world, where most people in the world live, most countries, girls today go to school as long as boys, more or less. Right? That doesn't mean that gender equity is achieved, not at all. They still, still are confronted to terrible, terrible limitations. But schooling is there in the world today. Now, we miss the majority. When you answer, you answer according to the worst places, and there you are right, but you miss the majority. 
What about poverty? Well, it's, it's very clear that poverty here was almost halved. And in US, when we asked the public, only 5% got it right. Huh? And you? Ah, you almost made it to the ship. <laughs> That literally, just a few of you, just a few of you, huh? There must be, there must be preconceived ideas. You know? And many in the rich countries, they think that, oh, we can never end extreme poverty. Of course they think so, because they don't even know what has happened. The first thing to think about the future is to know about the present. These questions were a few of the first one in the pilot phase of the ignorance project in Gapminder Foundation that we run. And uh, it was started this project last year by my boss and also my son, Ola Rosli, uh, <laughs> his co-founder and director. And he wanted, Ola told me we have to be more systematic when we fight devastating ignorance. So already the pilots revealed this, that so many in the public score worse than random. So we have to think about preconceived ideas. And one of the main preconceived ideas is about world income distribution. Look here, this is how it was 1975. It's a number of people on each income. <laughs> From one dollar, one dollar a day. See, there was one hump here around one dollar a day. And then there was one hump here somewhere between 10 and $100. The world was two groups. It was a camel world, like a camel with two humps, the poor one and the rich one. And there were fewer in between. But look how this has changed. As I go forward, what has changed, the world population has grown, you know, and the humps start to merge. Uh, the lower hump merge with the upper hump. And the camel dies and we have a dromedary world with one hump only. The percent in poverty has decreased. Still, it's appalling that so many remain in extreme poverty. We still have this group, almost a billion over there, but that can be ended now. The challenge we have now, you know, is to get away from the understand where the majority is. And that is very clearly shown in this question. We asked, what is the percentage of the world's one-year-old children who have got those basic vaccines against measles and other things that we've had for many years? 20, 50, or 80 percent. Now, this is what the US public and the Swedish answer. You see, look at the Swedish result, you know what the right answer is. <laughs> Who the heck is professor of global health in that country? Well, well it's me. It's me. You see, it's very difficult. This. It's very difficult. Huh? However, Uda's approach to really measure what we know, made headlines. And CNN published these results on their web and they had the questions there, millions answered. And I think there was about, there was about 2,000 comments. And this was one of the comments, you know. I bet no member of the media passed the test, he said. So Ola told me, take these devices, you are invited to media conferences, give it to them and measure what the media know. And ladies and gentlemen, for the first time, the informal result from a conference with US media. And then, lately, from the European Union media. <laughs> you see, the problem is not that people don't read and listen to the media. The problem is that the media doesn't know themselves. <laughs> what shall we do about this, Ula? Do you have an idea? Yes, uh, I have an idea, but first, uh, I'm so sorry that you were beaten by the chimps. Uh, fortunately, I will be able to comfort you by showing why it was not your fault, actually. Then I will equip you with some tricks for beating the chimps in the future. That's basically what I will do. But first, let's look at why are we so ignorant, and it all starts in this place. It's Hudiksvall, it's a city in northern Sweden. It's a neighborhood where I grew up. And it's a, a neighborhood with a large problem. Actually, it has exactly the same problem which existed in all the neighborhoods where you grew up as well. It was not representative. 
Okay, it gave me a very biased view of how life is on this planet. So this is the first piece of the ignorance puzzle. We have a personal bias. We have all different experiences from communities and people we meet. And on top of this, we start school and we have the next problem. Well, I like schools, but teachers tend to uh, teach uh, outdated worldview because they learned something when they went to school and now they describe this work to the students without any bad intentions. And those books, of course, that are printed are outdated uh, in a world that changes. And there is really no practice to keep the teaching material up to date. So that's what we're focusing on. So we have these outdated facts added on top of our personal bias. What happens next is news, okay? An excellent journalist knows how to pick the story that will make headlines, and people would read it because it's sensational. It's unusual events are more interesting, don't? And and uh, they are exaggerated, and especially things we're afraid of would get. I mean, a shark attack on a Swedish person would get headlines for weeks in Sweden. You know? Okay. So these three skewed sources of information was really hard to get away from, wasn't it? You know, they, they kind of bombardize us and equip our mind with a lot of strange ideas. And on top of it, we put the very thing that makes us humans, our human intuition, okay? It was good in evolution. Uh, it helped us generalize and jump to conclusions very, very fast. Uh, it ha uh, helped us exaggerate what we're afraid of. And we see causality where there is none. And we then get an illusion on, of confidence where we believe that we are the best car drivers uh, above the average. Everybody answered that question. Yeah, I drive cars better. Okay, this was good evolutionary, but now when it comes to the worldview, it is the exact reason why it's upside down. The trends that are increasing are instead falling and the other way around. And in this case, the chimps use our intuition against us. And it becomes our weakness instead of our strength. It was supposed to be our strength, wasn't it? So how do we solve such problem? First, we need to measure it, and then we need to cure it. So by measuring it, we can understand what is the pattern of ignorance. We started the pilot last year, and now we're... Okay, so I hope from uh, the movie you get some idea about why you scored the way you scored. Um, and that you really need good data to uh, to see how the world is uh, is developing. Okay, so now back to more logistics and, and uh, in the in the minor global health. Um, as um, you can see on uh, the Google Classroom, uh, there's a roster. The schedule is in two uh, variants. There's this. A spreadsheet um, form um, where you can see tabs by um, by week, um, and uh, there's the the Google Calendar, uh, which you can embed in your own uh, calendar uh, as well. There was one student who said, "Can you send me another um, iCall version for for Apple? If you have problems uh, with that, please let me know. Then we'll." Uh, try to uh, to fix that. Now, I, I got a question as well. Uh, is everything compulsory? Yes, but that's not only for the minor global health, that's for all minor education. Um, and I always state not being present is not an option. If you talk with former uh, minor global health students, I can be a real pain in the ass if you're not there. Um, and why um, specifically for this minor? Because we invite a lot of uh, lecturers from within Erasmus Medical Center, but also from outside uh, Erasmus Medical Center, um, and we just want to be you to uh, to be there and to uh, to listen uh, to them. Uh, and for such a program, it's just too much effort by the coordinators and by the lecturers for you not uh, to be there. If there are reasons why you cannot make it, and um, of course, if there's a, a marriage or a funeral or whatever, uh, or you're sick, or please let me know. But let me know beforehand, and then we can uh, can easily find a, uh, a way to uh, to tackle uh, to tackle that. Um, 
So for uh, as, as an etiquette, so I see that nearly everyone has his or her uh, webcam uh, on. Not everyone. There are some with the webcam closed. Um, so um, as you can see, also for me, although I'm mostly working with Microsoft Teams, somewhat less with uh, with Zoom. Um, also, I need to be in time to prepare and to to make sure that the share uh, screen option is working, etc. So. Most of the time I will be moderating the sessions and the lecturers can just give their lecture. So I hope that those IT related uh, issues uh, uh, will not happen too often in, uh, in the coming weeks. Um, and so yeah, what we already said, ask your question using the chat. Uh, for me now that's a little difficult because I'm presenting, but as I'm moderating the other sessions, I can easily go to the chat and try to answer questions or move a question to, uh, to the one who is, uh, is presenting. Uh, and of course, we're not in a lecture hall. We cannot look at you. You cannot look at us uh, straight in the face, uh, straight in the eyes. Uh, the interaction is, of course, much different from what you normally would have in a lecture hall. Uh, and that's a pity. Um, uh, but I guess we should try to uh, to deal with it. With 96 students, the group is too big to have uh, a lecture hall available. Uh, so we have to do that online uh, and as the first years get um, first access to the education centers and to physical education uh, for you as third years that's going to be very difficult so I, you know there's no other solution there's no other option so but please try to be as interactive as uh, as possible uh, if you can for the, the the ones who are lecturing always very nice to to interact and to uh, get questions uh, from you. Okay, now as a, as a general structure, we have five tracks, um, really. Um, so there's what we call the Essentials of Global Health uh, track, um, which basically deals with basic facts in, uh, in global health. And of course, everyone will try to put a Corona uh, uh, pudding on top of it. Um, but this is just the basics in uh, in global health. Things you need to know to interpret data uh, and to 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 look at data from from studies or from other uh, institutions uh, and see how the world is developing. Um, for that, um, you have the book, the textbook we have been using for the last couple of years, uh, Global Health One on One, available uh, through uh, perusal. Um, if you, um, oh, I have to log in. I will send you an email how to get to uh, perusal and log in with your global health education uh, account. If you're logged in, you would see a screen like this. Um, I will back, come back to the questions later. Um, so you will see a screen like uh, like this. Uh, if you click on the library tab, you see uh, things that are available to uh, to read for you. Uh, the global health book is there, uh, and if you click open, uh, then this will happen, and you will get a flowable version of what is called uh, this uh, this book. And if you go to the next section in the, on the bottom, you will go to the next session and uh, you can also jump uh, to uh, sections or chapters or uh, or whatever. So it's a digital version of the Global Health One on One book. Um, and in that sense, it's freely available for you to uh, to read. Uh, at the same time, um, I send you the link for uh, this Coursera for Campus initiative. So Coursera, Russian University is part of Coursera. On Coursera, there's the Essentials of Global Health uh, course by Richard Skolnick based on his book, Global Health uh, 101. Um, and um, so if you have registered uh, and you can uh, go to uh, to your course and you will see what the course is about. It's exactly 10 weeks as we uh, are running for 10 weeks. So that's nice. 
and, and the good thing is that um, it tells you how much time you it will take for you to go through videos and readings. Um, so there's text, there's videos, there's other uh, materials, there are quizzes. Um, and uh, so this is really uh, the foundation, the basics of uh, on global health, of our minor global health. Um, I will come back to, uh, to that as well. So what, what's very uh, important for the Coursera uh, course is it is we can use it for free until the end of December. Um, after December, you cannot use it anymore. So if you would have a re-exam, if you would fill your exam uh, in November and you would need to do a reset of your exam in January, um, you will not have access to the Coursera course anymore, unless, um, and that is very important, unless you go through the whole Coursera course, uh, make it through all the quizzes and get your certificate at the end, because you will get an official certificate from Coursera at the end. Um, and if you have finished uh, the whole Coursera course and get your certificate, you have access to uh, the program content uh, for the rest of your life. So then, uh, life will be much easier if you have a, have a reset. So then about the essentials of global health. Um, there's a track, Corona and uh, Global Health, where we try to invite people involved in uh, global health as well as in the pandemic response, Corona response in various ways that could be from public health, that could be from vaccine development, that could be from treatment uh, and other fields. Um, and these are um, marked as uh, uh, in red, uh, for instance, and uh, on uh, the 15th, on the, uh, the 22nd of, of September, for instance, we've invited Professor Jan Bakker. Jan Bakker is an intensive care doctor, uh, works here, but also work, has a position at Columbia University at, uh, in New York and also in Chile. Um, and he will uh, share his um, uh, experiences with Corona in New York and how ICU care there was organized or disorganized, uh, really. And, and Richard Skolnick and his son will join uh, as well, because the son of Richard Skolnick is an ICU physician uh, as well. So the red bars are the uh, um, Corona and, and, and global health uh, bars. So uh, 29th of September, uh, Professor Oscar Franco Duran, who is a former professor of epidemiology at the Rossus Medical Center, originally from Colombia, will discuss uh, native uh, people in Latin America uh, and their risk for uh, COVID-19 uh, in, uh, in this uh, pandemic. Um, and you will find other uh, people as part of the uh, corona global health track. So we also have a humans of global health uh, track. This is specifically people we have in the program for somewhat longer time um, and uh, really working uh, in uh, in global health. Uh, we have Florin Oudenaarde who used to work for uh, Medicine Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders on emergency responses. So she will uh, discuss with you um, how uh, working in an emergency area is, how that looks like. Um, and we will have other people from uh, Doctors Without Borders to discuss emergency responses uh, during the corona epidemic uh, uh, at the moment. And uh, Marloes van Wolswinkel, who is an ID physician currently in Maastricht, but who was trained in Rotterdam. And Marloes, uh, Marlies, uh, sorry, uh, spent uh, a month working in uh, Sierra Leone uh, during the Ebola uh, outbreak in uh, 2015. So we'll share, she will share her experience, her experiences with you, how that is to work under those uh, circumstances. Then as every year we invite uh, people to give a masterclass and, and tomorrow that will be Richard Skolnick, next week that will be Frank Snowden, I will come back to those later. Uh, Hugo Tempelman from South Africa will give a masterclass. Uh, Eduardo Garbi from Cuba. Uh, and, but also the people from Gapminer, you just saw Aura Rosling. Uh, they will also at the end give uh, a masterclass on, on factfulness. So what we 
expect from the people who give a masterclass is that on the one hand, they will talk about their topic on what is on their heart, why they and what they are doing in global health. Um, and, and but the second part will be on uh, on their career. So as in, very often, these are medical doctors. So what made them choose at what point as a student or later on to go for a career in, uh, in global health? And they will share that with you uh, as well. And then, of course, we have uh, the, uh, the assignment and the assignment preparation and country preparations uh, uh, once every two weeks uh, as well. So I said we use this book, Global Health 101, uh, written by Richard Skolnick. This is Richard, uh, and this is, is uh, a screenshot from his uh, Yale uh, Coursera course, um, which goes in parallel with the book. So I should make a, a remark on the Coursera course, because I guess in the Coursera course, he refers to the third edition of the Global Health 101 book, and you have the fourth edition, the naming of the chapters is not different, but perhaps if you refer to pages, that could be uh, different from the edition you have digitally um, available. Um, the next week we will have Frank Snowden uh, to lecture on epidemics and, and society. So Frank Snowden published a book uh, November 2019 called Epidemics and Society. And in the book, he deals with a uh, couple of um, pandemics, uh, the plague, the sort of Black Death. Uh, he deals with uh, TB, he deals with HIV AIDS, he deals with Ebola. Uh, and in the introduction, he deals also with, um, with COVID-19, with Corona. Uh, but he, the book is written from the perspective of, uh, of an historian uh, and really looks into how societies have reacted to pandemics. And the very funny thing is that also already in the 14th century, when plague first hit Europe, um, the measures taken, uh, quarantine, uh, the army uh, being there, was exactly the same as we see now again uh, 600 years later or 700 years later uh, during Corona. So you can learn a lot from uh, from history and you see a lot of similarities going from one pandemic to to another pandemic. Uh, which is really very, uh, very striking. So he will talk about that uh, next week. So, and, and I would really, um, before I forget, really advise you to read a book. If you want to uh, buy the book, uh, the publisher of Frank Snowden and of the book will give you uh, a code uh, whereby you could get 30% uh, discount on, uh, on the book. So if you're interested, if you want to buy the book, let me know. I can give you the code and you get 30% off uh, the book. It's very, very nice. One other thing I would uh, advise you to, to read is this book, The Great Influenza by John Berry, because if this is about the Spanish flu in 1918, 1920. Um, and if you compare what's happening then and what's happening now, you will see so many similarities. As said, they used quinine as an antimalarial to treat influenza, it didn't work. We are now using hydroxychloroquine, an antimalarial drug to treat uh, COVID, didn't work. Uh, you have stupid mayors who don't want to do anything with contact tracing or isolation or whatever. They had a huge pandemic in their cities or their um, areas. Uh, you have people who were very uh, successful in doing that in quarantining people, etc. Um, so the similarities are uh, are there, and, and and what's also very striking is that there were Trump-like people in 1918, 1920 uh, as well, making the flu pandemic uh, much worse than it could have been if people who would have listened to uh, to advice from scientists. Um, this is also about the, uh, the flu. This is not a book. This is more like a detective. This is available on uh, perusal for you as well. Uh, well. But you have to pay for it yourself. Uh, I think it's $6.79 or something like that. So, so no, not uh, even $7. But uh, this is more like a detective story uh, on the search for the influenza virus causing the, the Spanish flu in 1918. And then, of course, this person 
if you want to know about the world, read his book uh, later on. Then one other thing, and uh, this is Judith van der Kamp. Judith is an anthropologist. She uh, had been working in Cameroon for a long time, um, making observations about how doctors uh, from the West, uh, but also students uh, from the West uh, started working or doing elective in a hospital in Cameroon and how um, white people perceive uh, how they are doing and how they are perceived by uh, the local uh, the local people. Uh, it's a very critical book, uh, The Derde Wereld op Your CV, The Third World on Your CV. Uh, it's only available in Dutch, sorry. Um, it's very critical, but it doesn't say you should not go. It's more that it says read a book, be prepared for the different perspectives you have uh, if you come from a European country and go to an African country to to work in a hospital, uh, for instance. So she will lecture on that as well in uh, in week nine. Okay, um, so that about the uh, the program and uh, and the schedule. Um, so about the uh, assignments, as I said in May uh, already, uh, we have Corona is global health as a as a theme. Um, Diseases don't stop at uh, at borders, and Corona, of course, has a huge impact on health of people, on healthcare, on healthcare systems, on science, development of vaccines, development of new drugs, uh, but also on society, economy, people losing their jobs, poverty, uh, etc. But also on a personal level, uh, people. Uh, can be in lockdown, can become depressed or whatever. So it goes from an individual to, to society uh, and the effects of, uh, of Corona. Um, so in the, in the assignments, we really want you to focus on, on that aspect of, uh, of Corona as well. So um, I will look at the chat if there are more questions later, but uh, so there are three types of assignments you can do. So um, you can write a review uh, on um, responses countries have taken uh, on the Corona pandemic, uh, measures they have taken, lockdown, no lockdown, mouth masks, no mouth masks, social distancing, one meter, one half meeting, two meters, etc. And uh, see how they, they implement it uh, these uh, these measures. So uh, Mark Rutte says that we have an intelligent lockdown. If you look at other countries uh, like Spain and Italy, uh, but also France, it has been much more top down. Um, so what are the differences and do people um, react differently and, and are the effects different or, uh, or not? There's an initiative from the people from Colombia uh, to make this into um, a global uh, research project um, where um, you per group um, could um, look into this um, and I will talk about it later. So the other assignment you can do is a video documentary, although that probably will be more difficult because filming in the country you're going to will not be possible. So, but of course, as I talked with Mireille van Westrein, and she's one of the um, supervisors of the Colombia uh, group, uh, said there are a lot of people from Colombia living in the Netherlands, living in Rotterdam, and you can also interview them to hear from them uh, what's happening in, uh, in Colombia um, and what effect uh, lockdown or whatever have on their uh, family, relatives, friends, uh, etc., and how they think of that, how that is being done in uh, in the Netherlands. So you could also take that, uh, that lead. And then the pot and fit cast, uh, you can do as well. So about the review, um, it would be very nice to have uh, per group country, um, uh, two students at least working on, uh, on that project. Um, and what I said, there's a uh, initiative from the people from uh, Colombia to to pull these uh, to pull these data to see what measures have been taken and what effects they uh, they have to come to a more global understanding of 
what has happened in the world during uh, this, uh, this pandemic. And as I said, you could focus on health and healthcare issues, more on the medical part. You could also focus on the economical part, but also on the societal uh, part uh, and personal uh, effects of, uh, of Corona in the, in the different countries. And of course, the, the local coordinators will be available for you to discuss this. Um, and we also have peer students or former students uh, locally to uh, for you to to use as and to interview or to talk with about their perspective on, on these effects in their countries um so about the video documentary as i said um, again on the effects of the corona pandemic uh, that could be locally here um, perhaps you can go to to a nursing home perhaps you have a grandparent in a nursing home uh, who has survived corona or who at least has been in a nursing home during corona and seeing people around her around them uh, get sick and die uh, that could be it could also be more on the national uh, level uh, or international as i said um, and, and compare uh, responses uh, accordingly um, and you could talk with experts uh, doctors, students, ordinary people, uh, and I said uh, immigrants here from the, the different countries to, to give their perspective uh, as, uh, as well. And if you want to know how the, the, the video documentaries look like uh, from earlier years, uh, I will, uh, there's a link to the YouTube channel on the website uh, where you can see the, the, the earlier uh, video documentaries made in, in other years. And so I, I got a lot of responses on the podcast and the vidcast. Um, if you want to do uh, to make a podcast series, uh, you can do that with two or three. That's for all the assignments. You can do it with two or three people, Max. Um, for the podcast and vidcast, uh, if you want to do that, um, then the the um, um, workshops by Wichele Bouda uh, coming Friday and next week Friday are compulsory because he will teach you some technical uh, things, technical stuff, but also how to build your interview, how to structure your interview to get the right story and how to perhaps cut and paste uh, with the programs available to make it into a very nice 10 to 15 minute max uh, pod or, or feedcast. Um, the ones who have uh, volunteered to do a pod of feedcast are, are welcome. Um, you could do that together per country, but you could also look for uh, people who are assigned or going to other countries to uh, to collaborate and to work uh, together uh, in that uh, for the pot and fitcast. And I think if you work with two or three together, you should think about a theme you would like to uh, develop uh, with uh, these podcasts or fitcasts. And so I I've named it 10 questions too. If you think that a podcast max can can last 10 to 15 minutes then probably 10 questions 10 questions is too much so perhaps you should call it five questions too uh, but you could also make it into another uh, thematic uh, approach another theme you would like to discuss with the people you're going to interview um, and of course you can interview uh, the the international people the supervisors, the students in the countries you're going to uh, your country or other countries as well uh, you could uh, interview people from Erasmus medical center or from the the ggd the municipal health uh, or nationally from rvm or others um, Maarten friends so the vice dean education and i made a whole list of people we would like to have in in a mooc like online course like um, uh, program uh, on uh, on Corona, so I have a whole list available of these local and national people. Uh, if you're interested in interviewing them, uh, and of course we will hook you up uh, with them to uh, to do that. With the set, you could also, uh, for instance, do a pod and fitcast on experiences of students with with lockdown and social distancing and partying and and and. Uh, what affects first year medical students here, for instance, have um, because of uh, social distancing and not being able to be um, in the educational center of Erasmus Medical Center, for instance, the whole time of Technical University, Delft or whatever. So um, every topic 
um, is okay, uh, at, but at least you would need to come up with a, with a series or a couple of, of pod and fit cast uh, to make it into uh, a real uh, assignment. And we can discuss that uh, on the way uh, to, uh, to the end of this uh, minor. Um, I also emailed you about uh, the GGD, so the municipal health, uh, because they're very much looking into people to support them uh, mainly with contact tracing. Uh, I already approached them in, in May. They were very busy at that moment, so too busy to discuss that with me. Uh, thereafter, it was very quickly, not so many cases anymore, so they didn't have uh, too many people uh, working on uh, contact tracing. And now, of course, with, with increasing cases, they are in need of uh, well-trained personnel uh, as, as well. So I had a meeting last Thursday uh, with them, uh, with Saskia van der Merwe, who's heading their uh, educational program. Um, so what we discussed, and she will send me uh, some more information. Uh, I had hoped to, to have received it already, but did not so far. So I will ask her to, to send it to me uh, ASAP. Um, so what I want to do is that for the contact tracing and for you to work at the GGD uh, in contact tracing, um, you really need to be trained well. Um, so training and what to do if you phone people at home um, who have been in touch or in contact with a proven corona case, um, that, that needs some special training, some special attention because you, uh, you cannot be rude to people and you have to be... Uh, empathic, etc., and you need to follow some rules and some uh, structured interview to to be able to do that very well. And you have to report it, like in uh, in a patient file. Uh, uh, you have to report these data. So they think it's very important to train you, um, and um, if time uh, allows, then later on you can be part of their contact tracing um, team if you want to. They also have other uh, options available, uh, like being part of the team that looks more into strategy and policy into the corona response, or also in PR communication and logistics. So uh, more like the organizational uh, health management, uh, public health part of what uh, GGD is, uh, is doing. So uh, as said, I will get the, the, uh, the more precise uh, uh, options and, and what I could offer you uh, on paper as soon as possible. Um, but um, they had these three teams and you can um, um, be with them uh, to learn about contact tracing, to get trained to do contact tracing and to see how that's being done, uh, being supervised by other students or by them. Uh, but you can also participate in the other teams like the strategy and policy teams um, to, to look into more strategic and policy options to how to combat and how to tackle and where to go with contact tracing, etc. Um, and they offered also that you could do some small research projects. Uh, someone asked me already, can I do a video documentary also on the work of the GGD? Yes, that's possible. Um, and for the for the research project as an assignment, uh, that's more that they have a, they sit on a lot of data. Um, and, and currently not knowing uh, what what to do, um, but that very often relates to to the contract tracing, but also to the the policy making of uh, of the public health response now. Okay, then uh, short because we have to wrap up. It's nearly one um, about the exam. So there will be a written exam in week ten, which will which will contain fifteen uh, essay questions, so open questions. Um, it will be either Thursday 5th or Friday 6th of November. Um, not sure what date exactly that will be. Uh, it will be a digital uh, exam using test vision. Uh, and so far, it's also unclear if that's going to be done at Eros Medical Center, at uh, Eros University, the Wouterstein campus, or elsewhere physically or that it will be an online proctored uh, exam. So I have, no, I have no more information than this. And I hope that the minor committee will, will let us know as soon as possible uh, about those options. 
So uh, for your final grade, uh, the written exam counts for 50%, the assignments count for 50%, so you will get two grades uh, and the mean of them will be your final grade. And one thing you would need to obtain is at least your Coursera Certificate Essentials of Global Health um, uh, as a prerequisite to, to get your uh, final grade. Um, and then about uh, the trip abroad. So uh, in, in May, we communicated with you that, uh, that all the uh, centers, uh, in international centers, universities and hospitals, etc., uh, would like to welcome you next uh, summer. Um, that plan is still there. Um, but of course, we will have to see how SARS-CoV-2, uh, the corona pandemic, will uh, develop. Um, and also if a vaccine will be available or that a second or third wave will never happen and that the whole corona will be over by spring uh, next year. So that is something to, uh, to keep a close uh, eye uh, on. And the other thing is that uh, for the exact dates, um, of course, we will have to communicate it with uh, the local centers, but, but I think even more, um, with, uh, with you as a, as a group. Um, so that is what we will do uh, during the coming weeks or months to discuss that with you as well um, per, uh, per group. But you can probably understand that things are very fluid at the moment, that one day you have increased numbers and we're gonna see a second wave and then next day numbers decrease again and there is no second wave. So. We'll have to see how uh, how that developed. The the Spanish flu in 1918 came in three waves in two years, um, and it has been predicted that that SARS-CoV-2 will behave in a similar way. But SARS-CoV-2 is a very different uh, virus than than influenza was. So we uh, we have to see if that uh, if that comes true. Um, so yes, we so. Um, of course, these are some people uh, within Eros Medical Center, Diederik Gomes and Skypers. I can imagine that these are the ones you would like to ask these 10 questions to for your pot and fitcast. Please do. Uh, they're very open to, uh, to do that. My own co uh, also, she's very, very busy at the moment as well. Bart Reinders from the treatment uh, research in the plasma, convalescent plasma uh, trial. These guys uh, will, uh, will give a masterclass so you can uh, contact them uh, as well. And of course, these one will be in the program anyway to, uh, to give a masterclass as well. All very passionate people about and passionate about their work and passionate about global health. Okay, I will go to the chats to see if there are questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, is it possible to be um, with two behind one computer to watch the, the, the lectures? Um, yes, that's possible, but then of course we need to see you. Yesterday we kicked off uh, Summer Course 1 and Summer Course 2 of uh, Research Master Program Infection Immunity, which I'm coordinating as well. Uh, there were four people uh, in a room watching uh, the lectures online together. So um, if you are a family, um, and um, can sit together, uh, that's uh, of course uh, a possibility. Um, but, but let me know in the chat who's with who, uh, just to see, to be sure that you're there and not get chased by me that you that we didn't see you at the attendance list. Um, then Anouk asks, are the VIT and podcast lectures for everyone? No. So the VIT and podcast lectures Friday, coming Friday and the week after is only compulsory for the ones who want to do a pod and fitcast. The rest who doesn't want to do a pod and fitcast uh, as a free afternoon uh, coming Friday and the Friday after. Um, yes, so you can sit with three behind the computer as well. Um, do we get an access code for the book? I sent everyone on his or her global health education email account an uh, access code for the book. So please email me if you didn't get uh, that access code. Uh, 
and uh, I can I can provide you with uh, with it. Yes, yeah, so, someone has said is mailed. Um, but if if it isn't working, uh, let me know. Um, so then the question about the Coursera course, the Coursera course has an assignment, a quiz it with a due date. Um, will these be tracked by the miner in any way? And if so, will you still be able to fill out assignments, quizzes after this due date or will you have filled the class? No. So um, the, the Coursera course works so that it's 10 weeks, like the Miner Global Health is 10 weeks. So there's a program per week. Uh, we try to have the essential global health lectures by our teachers. Um, the topics uh, we try to get together with the topics being covered in the Coursera course, so that it's more that it is um, explaining better or even more than what is on the Coursera course in the Global Health 101 book. Um, if you take longer, so uh, that's that's fine uh, with me. Um, I have to check, but perhaps uh, the Coursera people will know that. Um, that so there are due dates because it's a program which is separated per week. Uh, the best thing of, for you would be to, to just go through that per week. Uh, I have to, we'll have to check if you will get your certificate if you just do nothing one week and then do two weeks in the next uh, week. I, I think if you just do uh, the quizzes, etc., then that should not be a problem. But I will check and let you know uh, as well. Failing the Coursera course, yeah, that, that really cannot happen. So uh, that, uh, if you can try again uh, in, in the quizzes. So um, um, there's only one exam, so there will not be two exams. Uh, and everything we cover in the minor global health um, will be potentially um, an exam question. Um, but the focus will be on the uh, essential uh, global health. So the lectures within the essential global health tracks and the essential global health Coursera course and the global health one on one book. Um, because we feel that the master classes as well as the uh, uh, other tracks are more of added value. You should more experience what people are saying and hear from them than uh, that it is really exam stuff, so to say. Um, yeah, so for next week, there are preparation um, and uh, per uh, country. Um, so they are scheduled in in uh, in the roster, um, but probably the, the the ones supervising the various countries and groups uh, will discuss with you what would be the best timing to to have an online session for uh, these preparatory sessions. So for now they are scheduled uh, on Monday, Tuesday, um, Wednesday, and, and Thursday, I guess, spread over the week per country, a uh, different day. But if you feel that it is more convenient to discuss this on a later moment with your supervisors, that's okay as well. You can um, try to uh, communicate it with them. And I will let you know their uh, email addresses and mobile phone numbers uh, later on this, uh, this week uh, as well. Um, okay, Cora. Do you have to partake in those if you don't go to those countries? Yes. So if you decide not to go in the summer, you still should be at the preparatory sessions because it's not about only about preparation for the country you're going to, for what kind of country it is, about culture, about healthcare setting, but it's also about your assignment uh, and being connected to people elsewhere, uh, to the country you go to, to, to discuss items on your, on your assignment. So yes, you need to be there. Uh, what pages of the Global Health 101 course do we need to read or does the Coursera course tell us? Yes, the Coursera course will tell you what chapters uh, will be covered, so you can refer to the chapters in the digital version. Um, what I will also do is to uh, update the reader, uh, because also in the reader 
are refer references to the um, Global Health 101 chapters uh, you would need to uh, you would need to read. But but the Coursera cor course um, will cover um, the the essential parts of the Global Health 101 book uh, as well. Will there be another kickoff session in case you missed the one in May? No. Uh, the the uh, the kickoff the the, sh the 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 sheets the PowerPoint of the kickoff in May is online uh, as well as the recording. So you can just uh, check the uh, the sheets and you can check the the recording uh, of what we discussed in uh, in May. Oh yeah, very good question. What exactly are um, the refreshment classes, the refreshment classes at the end of every week are for you. Uh, and I had two from 9-11 and 11 to 1, but I reduced that to, to only one session from 9 to 11. It's mainly if there are uh, things unclear or if you have any questions about the lectures, about Coursera, about Perusal, about the Global Health one on one book or every other question you might have about topics we covered for that week, uh, you can ask. Uh, and if you don't have any questions, up to you. It's not compulsory, so uh, you have a free Friday. Um, but it's more a moment to, to discuss with you any questions you might have on uh, the lectures and, and the, the topics uh, covered in that week. Uh, do we also need to do assignments in perusal? No. I saw there was one uh, assignment still on, uh, which was copied from, uh, from last year. Um, no, you don't need to do any uh, uh, assignments in uh, Perusal. The last couple of years we used Perusal to get you reading through the book, uh, but that is now covered by the Coursera course. So Perusal only is there for uh, uh, Global Health 101 being digitally available for, uh, for you. No assignments in Perusal. Will there be an overview of what the ex assignments exactly should include? Yes, there is already um, uh, an instruction about the, the, the review, case review, uh, and we will also put them. And there's also for the video documentary um, um, instructions about what to, uh, to do. Uh, and for the pot of vidcast, we will uh, put it up as well. Do we need to do the Coursera assignments by ourselves? Yes, or are we going over these assignments together? No, but these are things we can discuss during the refreshment classes on uh, Friday. And then Anouk has a question, if we do an assignment within the GGD, do we still have to do the other assignments, review, podcast? No. So it's a review, it's a video documentary, it's a pot or vidcast, uh, or it is potentially an assignment you can do at the, the GGD, but that is more than like the review uh, you've been, uh, you could choose from uh, as well. Yeah, so there is a, uh, where can we find the info regarding the review? Uh, there is a, um, um, I will show you in, in Google Classroom uh, right away. Um, there is an instruction uh, for what we call the case review uh, last couple of years, and we will adopt that to the general review uh, for, uh, for this year. But these documents are in Google Classroom, and now I will try to So can you see my screen, my, the Google Classroom uh, at the moment? Yeah? Okay, so um, if you go to, uh, to the link um, with the Google Classroom I sent you earlier, then uh, this is uh, how it looks like. So there's a stream where you can see if there are updates, you can also post comments, etc. yourself. But if you go to the Classwork tab, um, you can find all uh, materials uh, we use available there. So there's Coursera for Campus. This is just a link to the Coursera for Campus uh, site. Um, you can find 
uh, lecture sheets uh, and you will get a direct link to the different weeks with all the lectures uh, in a Google Drive uh, folder. Same for uh, the masterclasses where we will put every all information about the masterclasses. Um, there's two e-learnings, um, global health e-learning and health systems, health finance e-learning, uh, which are also part of, uh, of this, this minor, which explains somewhat differently then the Coursera course issues on this. So this is also a reading for you. Reader will be updated. Uh, and then if you click assignments, then uh, you will find a folder which is called uh, individual assignments. There are some folders which relate more to the assignments if you go abroad and if you come back. So healthcare checks, etc. cetera. Um, but there's also a folder called instructions. Um, and there you will find uh, instructions for the case review and also the, the grading form um, as well as the, the video documentary uh, instructions, guidelines and the assessment, the grading form for that. And I will put uh, two new folders for the pod of vidcast and for the, uh, the review in general uh, as well. Here, so you can read what, to, uh, what your assignments should, uh, should look like. Uh, and we will put um, a test exam for the, so the exams from the last couple of last two years for you to get an idea about what kind of questions uh, were asked. Now, of course, that was only five weeks in Rotterdam. Uh, now we have 10 weeks. We spread it out a little bit, but it will give you an idea of what kind of questions you can expect um, from, uh, from the exam. Do we also have to participate in the preparation courses of countries we are not assigned to? No, no. So you only are requested, required to participate in the uh, preparation courses of the country you are assigned to, and the others you can uh, you can skip. If you want to, you can join, but um, not necessarily so. Okay. Any other questions so far? I will put the recording, uh, audio and video, as well as the sheets uh, uh, online. Uh, sheets are there already. Um, and if you have no other questions, then we see each other tomorrow afternoon. I, Nadine, I'm sorry. Yeah? yeah, I have one question because um, the email stated that we will use Zoom links for the upcoming master classes and other classes in this course. But I only see Google Meet sessions in the calendar and in the invitations. So I was wondering if we need to use the Google Meet session, no. the Google Meet link, or that we will receive another Zoom link. Uh, we will use Zoom. Um, and uh, yeah, oh, there is. Oh, this is irritating indeed. No, so we will use Zoom and not Google Meet because Google Meet is not that uh, that nice. So I, I send you uh, invitations. These were Zoom invitations, if that's correct or not. Um, because this was also a Zoom invitation for today. Yeah, I did see the Zoom link for today, but I didn't see it for tomorrow. So I will have to check again. Okay. Otherwise, if you go to the link for the, um, let's see if it's, oh yeah, I see what, what you mean. I will change that. Uh, so you can find it in the calendar. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, yes. I also have a question. Uh, we are going to uh, South Africa, but we are still uh, not divided in uh, two groups. We are still with 10 students. Uh, when yeah, are that's we... the same for, for Indonesia and that's the same for Brazil and we will discuss that next week then, uh, in, the, in the group session, in the country session. Okay. okay. Anything else? Yeah, as Josephine said in the email, stond ook Zoom links. So it's a Zoom we uh, we use. Yeah. Okay. No more questions. Then we see each other tomorrow afternoon. Take care for today. Bye.